Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Let me get uh, all the things I need. Got to have your little control there. This is the time of year that we celebrate the Christ child. And rightfully so. Even before he was born, it was clear that this child was going to be someone special. Well, then, when he was born, there in Bethlehem, well, a choir of angels arrived and announced his arrival, and they said to the shepherds that were in the fields that night, Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This child was going to be someone special. But what was not commonly understood was the way. This child was a child of destiny, born to do great things. But the way that was to come about, well, the Christ child is the Christ of the cross. His birth is celebrated at this time of year, but it was his death and maybe his resurrection that did us the most good. So today, let's focus on the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ, born a babe in Bethlehem. And let's let's look at the way in which he fulfilled his destiny. Jesus Christ was crucified and is risen. In 1 Corinthians 1, verses 2, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 2, the Apostle Paul told the church in Corinth, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then a few chapters later, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, Paul adds, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. Christ, crucified and risen. That was the way. And it is that important. It is everything to our faith. Today we will dwell on the cross and on Christ, but my purpose is not to revisit the whole familiar story of the crucifixion and the resurrection, but but rather to look at certain select scenes. And I also want to look at certain attributes of the Christ. I want for it to be real for all of us. For us to walk with and stand with Jesus. And as we walk, I want us to ponder together on the thoughts and emotions and the mindset of Jesus. Jesus took on human form, came as a baby, to face and overcome the suffering and temptations and trials that we all face in this sinful world. It was that human side. Those human emotions that the devil most attacked in those last desperate hours. It is that human side that we can most identify with. It is for that exact reason that I would like us to take this walk with Jesus. To draw close to him. Try to touch his humanity. And we will both look at and seek to gain those attributes that Christ showed in his walk to the cross. And I'd like to begin with a quote. Though the cross of Christ has been beautified by the poet and the artist, the avid seeker after God is likely to find it the same savage implement of destruction it was in the days of old. The way of the cross is still the pain-wracked path to spiritual power 
and fruitfulness. So do not seek to hide from it. Do not accept the easy way. These are the steps we have planned for today. It's not the easy way, I know. Our goal as Christians, of course, is to be crucified to our old selves so we can be risen to a fulfilling and victorious life in service to Christ. So let's allow Christ to show us the way. If you'd like to follow along, I'm going to begin, we'll be mostly in the book of Matthew. And beginning in verse, I'm sorry, in chapter 26 and down about verse 30. But before we begin, let's, let's gather our bearings a little bit. Never mind. We begin in Jerusalem. Jesus has shared the Last Supper with his disciples. The betrayer has been revealed. And confusion fills the minds of the disciples. And we come to our first scene as they leave the upper room on the way to Gethsemane. Picture the clear night. Stars in the sky. You know, it's a, ni- it's a nice walk. Out of Jerusalem, across the Kidron Valley, Jesus and his disciples. This is the scene. Walking and talking. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 30. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. He's not, he's not trying to scare them. He wants to reassure his disciples. But they are not reassured. Walking on through the night, there's mostly silence, but some talking among the disciples, and Jesus hears them. He knows he can only do so much to reassure them, and he worries for them because he loves them. He thinks to himself, this is why I came. His own words, his own words ring in his ears, for God so loved the world. You see, Jesus is on a mission of love, the birth, the life, and the quickly approaching death, all done in the name of love. The Christ is the revealing of the Father's love. And that love is what drives Jesus. It pulled him to this earth and it pulls him forward even now, even knowing what lies in wait for him. 1 John Chapter 3, verse 16 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And Jesus walks on through the night, pulled by love. And this is the first attribute that we need to look at. Because it it all starts with love. It always has, and it always will. Romans chapter 5 says, Verse 8 says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Everyone, everyone on this planet feels the pull of God's love. Some try to resist it or ignore it. But, well, that just makes life tougher, doesn't it? You see, living in this sinful world is, is always difficult. But to many people who ignore the pull of God's love, it's hopeless because there just seems to be no point. It's just an existence for them of self. That's all there is. Samuel Butler is a 19th century English novelist and um, in his book, The Way of All Flesh, he writes this. All our lives long, every day and every hour, we are engaged in the process of of accommodating our changed and unchanged selves to changed and unchanged surroundings. Living, in fact, is nothing less than this process of accommodation. 
When we fail in it a little, we are stupid. When we fail flagrantly, we are mad. When we suspend it temporarily, we sleep. When we give up the attempt altogether, we die. Well, now that's a sad way to look at life, isn't it? It's a sad way to live. There's a different way of seeing the world with love. And the great British preacher Charles Spurgeon explained his solution to the woes of the world. And here is his quote. I find no better cure for that depression than to trust in the Lord with all my heart and to seek to realize afresh the power and peace-speaking blood of Jesus and his infant love in dying upon the cross put, to put away all my transgressions. We as Christians have chosen to respond to the pull of Christ's love, to not resist but instead to accept the compelling love of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 14 and 15 say that for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. Christ's love compels us. To live for him. Christ was pulled to the cross by love and we are pulled by love to live for Christ instead of for ourselves. So let's go back and catch up with Christ. He arrives at the next scene I would like to look at and it is the Garden of Gethsemane. With moonlight beaming through the olive trees, here outside of the city, it is quiet and peaceful, even tonight. Although there there is no peace in the heart of Jesus. Matthew, chapter 26, beginning in verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground. And prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus falls to the ground, not kneels down. It's not what it says. Jesus falls to the ground. Can you feel his hands and knees at the ground? He prays. He prays hard, so hard that the Gospel of Luke says that his sweat falls like drops of blood. And the devil's there. And the enemy does all he can to persuade Jesus that he's not up to it, that it's not worth it, that we are not worth the sacrifice that he's about to make. The result of this torment is anguish which is fit for a God, but it is poured out on the man, Jesus. It's so bad. If it is possible, he pleads, may this cup be taken from me. But then he finishes his prayer in submission. Yet not as I will, but as you will. The submission of Jesus is the second attribute I'd like to look at. The submission of Jesus here in the garden is his declaration of commitment. When he says that to his father, he says, I will, I will do this. Our submission is our commitment too. We as Christians want to be changed. 
to begin our walk to a new life. We want the world to know it, and we are changed. Do you know when you heard that question, the question of submission? Before you were baptized, they asked you, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you submit? You see, it's the baptism question, and part of it is very easy, the Savior part, because everyone wants a Savior. Very easy to accept, very happy to go forward with that. Um, but there was that second part of that. Lord, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord? Meaning that you will put Jesus first in your life. Well, to be honest, if we are being honest with ourselves, that's tough because many things vie to be Lord in our life. Money, family, even self. But all of these things are second, third, or fourth. You can rank them where you will, but they can't be first. The important thing is that nothing is more important or above Christ in your life. You want some examples, you say, from the Bible. Well, let's look in the Bible. You remember the rich young man? Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure and then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So money, according to Jesus, is not to be first in our lives. Oh, but, but family. Family is sacred, isn't it? Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, Jesus speaking says, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus is quite clear that family can't be first. Don't get me wrong. It's okay to love your family. But you'll actually be a better person for your family if you put Jesus first in your life. And then we get to self. Luke 9, 23 says, well, Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. We must deny self and put Christ first. Submission. Jesus submitted to the will of his Father. We too need to say, not my will, but thine be done. And so, pulled by love, Submission in hand, we're on our way. It's pretty clear now, it's not the easy way, is it? And now let's go back to ancient Israel. We left Jesus in the garden, as I recall. And there in Gethsemane, Jesus is seized by a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, and all the disciples desert him, just as he said they would. And those who arrest Jesus take him to Caiaphas. And the home, or rather the courtyard outside the home of Caiaphas, I'd like you to imagine this place if you will. This is the scene before us. Jesus is pulled roughly up the steps outside the home and through a large archway and into the outer court. Torches hang on, mounted on pillars, burn in the corners of the courtyard, and many people, many people fill the space, but they step away from Jesus as he is pushed to the front to face the high priest, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Continuing in Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 59. The chief priests in the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony these men are bringing against you? 
But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath. By the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. He stands before Caiaphas and says nothing. He does not defend himself against the lies. And then finally, when forced by oath, he tells the truth. Are you the Son of God? Yes, it is as you say. It is for this truth that he is convicted. Blasphemy, they call it. And what about this silence of Jesus? Submission? Yes, it is. But there's something else there too. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 say, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being found, I'm sorry, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man, as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus reveals true humility. Could he have spoken up for himself? Yes. But he humbled himself to death on a cross. It is this humility that is the next virtue I would like to look at. As we look at the Humility of Jesus, I do not want us to mistake humility for any type of weakness. Because humility is not weakness. True humility is a beautiful thing. Martin Luther said that true humility does not know that it is humble. If it did, it would be proud from the contemplation of so fine a virtue. Submission is commitment and humility is some sort of righteous resolve. Matthew 11 verse 29 says, Jesus speaking, says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Humility. True humility is not something that we're comes naturally. It's not something we're born with. So how do we become humble? How can we become humble? I suppose with every problem, the first thing is admitting that you have a problem, right? And so I guess first we have to accept that in our hearts we are proud. We have a high opinion of ourselves. It's different than self-confidence. It's something else. I'm not sure that I can exactly describe it, but it's a problem. And if you want to try and put your finger on it, it's a problem of pride. Quite simply, we are proud in our hearts. It is a flaw of our sinful nature. And we're taught this by this world. They only enforce it. It's only by staying focused on Christ and allowing his love to fill us and drive us that humility can just bud into a little flower. And then we have to work at it. Take, it takes careful practice and resolve for humility to continue to grow and hopefully blossom in our daily lives and thoughts. I found a list of ways that we can practice humility. You might question the source. I don't at all. 
It is from The Joy in Loving, A Guide to Daily Living, written by Mother Teresa. And she offers these ways that we can practice humility. To try to speak as little as possible as one of, of oneself. To mind one's own business. Not to want to manage other people's affairs. To avoid curiosity. To accept contradictions and correction cheerfully. To pass over the mistakes of others. To accept insults and injuries. To accept being slighted, forgotten, and disliked. To be kind and gentle, even under provocation. And these last two are my favorite. Never to stand on one's dignity. And to, always choo to choose always the hardest. To choose always the hardest. You know, I'm not sure I knew exactly what that meant when I first read it. But try it. You'll find humility. Humility is something that we struggle with, but we can gain true humility if we Focus on what God wants of us. Do what he puts before you and do not think that anything is beneath you. Look, Christ humbled himself and walked to the cross for us. If we truly want to cruci be crucified to our old selves, we should humble ourselves and walk down whatever dirty road he sends us. And that's where Jesus is, resolved in humble obedience. You see, whatever lies in wait for him, he's on his way. There is no stopping, only love pulling, only love, submission, and humility. It will be enough. Our next scene, our next scene is at the base of a rocky cliff outside the walls of Jerusalem. This place, it sits right off the road and many people pass by. Today, a crowd follows a beaten man. He is so beaten, in fact, that he needs help to carry his cross. There's a crown of thorns in his head. His steps fall heavily. Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 33. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus the king of the Jews. Crucifixion is not just a slow and painful death. It is purposefully public and it is by design a shameful thing. In this particular case, it needs to be public because the Christ is being lifted up for all man to see. And there's no fighting the shame either. That too has to be. Can you see Jesus there? His chest heaves. Almost impossible to catch his breath. The physical pain is horrible. But that's not the worst of it. Not for him. It was not the nails that killed Jesus. He drowned in shame. Not the shame of dying on a cross, but the shame of sin. Our sin, my sin. The sin of the world was put upon him. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, God made him who had no sin, to be sin. 
sin. Sin separates man from God. And there on the cross, Jesus takes on our sins until he can't feel the Father. Until he can't feel the love. It's, it's frightening to him. And he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he gives up his spirit. And he dies on a cross. Pulled there by love, submission in hand, robed in humility, all to endure our shame, our death. I believe that it is the shame of our sin which, well, it's key. It is the key for us to crucify our old selves if we embrace it. I know that sounds kind of funny, but it's not. Let me see if I can explain. You see, first we have to understand this. Sin is not a victimless act. You don't sin against yourself. You don't sin against other people. Every sin is a sin against God. Every sin, every time, a sin against God. You think about it. Adam and Eve eating fruit. Moses hitting a rock. David and Bathsheba. David and Bathsheba. All of these are sins against God. And all of these good people felt shame for their sin. They felt shame before God. Second, I'd like to clarify that when I say shame, I'm not talking about guilt. The devil wants us to feel guilty. He wants us to get bogged down in that. He wants us to feel guilty for each little sin we commit. He would like us to carry that guilt with us forever. But we should not feel guilty. You see, if we, if we ask, God is faithful and we are forgiven of our sins. No, not guilty. But shame, on the other hand, is a natural response to sin. Sin... is going against your Creator. And if you're willing to do that, you should feel ashamed. Our shame is caught up and rolled up in our sinful nature. And it stands against God. That part of us that we feel like we can't separate from. Our sinful nature, you know that thing. That thing that we all too often use as an excuse for our failures. It stands against God. It's not an excuse. It's our shame. It's the very thing that we need to be crucified to. And we can be crucified to our sinful nature. To think that you can't is to underestimate the gift of the Christ. Romans chapter 6, verses 3-7 through seven. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death, in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. You should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. 
freed from sin. We can choose to crucify our sinful nature and follow Christ's example. We focus on the love and the submission and, yes, work on our humility. And just maybe, if we do that, we can show the world around us that we are being recreated, resurrected, if you will, in God's image. Almost there. Christ, after he was crucified, is buried in a new tomb, in a garden. That tomb, which is not far from Golgotha, is our final scene. Early Sunday morning, sun's coming up. It's going to be a nice day. The fragrance of flowers drifts on the air. But those faithful women, those faithful women on their way to the garden tomb, they did not notice or care about such things. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angels said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly. And tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Jesus died and rose from the dead. Jesus finished the plan of salvation. Jesus, that little baby, accomplished all his father had asked of him. And he did it well. On this Sunday morning, what does Jesus feel? I'll give you one word. It's joy. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so with that, with that we come full circle. Because we can go back and imagine that field outside of Bethlehem with angels above it. And those angels looked down at those shepherds and said, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. You see, Christ's joy is our joy. Jesus, from the manger... To the cross. That was the way that was before him. That was the way to greatness. It went from love to joy. With submission and humility and all of that in the middle, but from love to joy. You see, Christ brought joy to this world. And for us, we can have joy too. All people, it says. All people. We have joy when we live for God, when we live our lives with God. But of course, our joy will only be complete when Jesus returns again and we can be with him. So for now, so for now we're stuck here and we must continue to walk with Jesus 
in the shadow of the cross, down that pain-wracked path. It is the way of the cross. It's not the easy way, but it is a walk worth taking. Bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, almighty God, Lord, we are humbled that you would come to this earth as a child, that you would live this life and sacrifice for us. We praise the name of Jesus. We praise Almighty God because of the gift of the Christ born in Bethlehem. We have the opportunity to be reunited with our Father in heaven. We pray all of these things, Lord, in your precious and loving name.